Welcome to the Black Writers Studio, a podcast presented by the Hurston Wright Foundation and hosted by Dr. Khadija Ali Coleman. The Black Writers Studio is dedicated to showcasing Black writers who are transforming the world today with their literary pen and creating a legacy for the culture. Dr. Tony Medina is the author or editor of over 17 books for adults and young readers. Medina's poetry, fiction, essays, and book reviews have appeared in over 100 publications and two CD compilations. Dr. Medina is the first professor of creative writing at Howard University and was awarded both the Langston Hughes Society Award and the first African Voices Literary Award. A poet, fiction writer, children's book author, activist, and beloved teacher, Dr. Tony Medina joins us in the Black Writers Studio today. All right, so I am so excited. Uh, you know, they call you Professor Tony Medina, right? But <laughs> I know you have- Tony Medina. That's right. <laughs> But you are such, um, you know, when I think of the, the Black arts literary community in the Washington, D.C. area, you, you know, you are a prominent name, you are a prominent face, but you just have such a national and international reach as well for just the myriad of stuff that you've done um, as a writer. And the list goes on. I mean, you're a multi-genre writer. You've done everything from poetry um, to you, you've done a graphic novel. I actually have that graphic novel um, that you've done. Um, and then you have, a, yes, you have um, a recent release. I, you know, I, I saw you proclaim on your Facebook, but a, a recent release release of short fiction so you know there's so many places that's right do that plug that's right that's right <laughs> and and I want I want you to talk Let, let's go <laughs> do not you tell the people tell the people what is that tell us let's start there you know it's a book of short fiction I know a lot of folks know you as a poet yeah what but you? I published fiction too I, I published um a piece that's in here I published like Geez, when was this? About 20 years ago, probably, uh, in uh, Brown Sugar, edited by Carol Taylor. She did a whole series a after that. Like, that was the first initial one of Black Erotica short fiction. Yes, yes. And she handpicked certain poets and commissioned us to write original fiction uh, for her piece. And I wrote this piece called uh, Random Acts of Violins, which is kind of like a crazy, kooky, non-linear love story or whatever and it's it opens this book actually so there's four pieces in here it's a mm -hmm. quartet of fiction oh i love it's it it's actually 76 pages a chat book is like usually 40 pages or less but mm -hmm. since it's not perfectly bound and stuff like that and it's sold in london exclusively for now yeah. wow wow and it's called che che Cole, third man books put it out uh they're located in um, nashville tennessee and also in london Mm -hmm. uh, che Che Cole is from the great classic um, Willie Colon salsa song, but it originates in Ghana as mm -hmm. a song about a dance and stuff mm -hmm. where you move your shoulders and your head and your, your knees and stuff like that. I love and it. there's a response chant and Che Che Cole is part of that. That's wonderful. Did you want to um, read anything or share anything from it? I won't do that because these are, these are kind of long pieces. Okay, um, okay. This is what the uh, the table of content looks like. But I might share something else that I have. I have some stuff. I'm in my little office, you know. That's right. So you in your black writer studio. And and what what are some necessities that you need around you or that you have around you? Being this, you know, you you're a prolific writer, and not only do you write, you teach others how to write, or you know, just about craft. What is it that you need to have in order to engage in your craft of writing? Well, you know what, Khadija, that's a good question because when it comes to writing, I'm kind of low maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm low maintenance on two uh, planes. I don't believe there's a such a thing as a writer's block. You know, mm -hmm. Toni Morrison once famously said in an interview that she doesn't believe in writer's block. Right. She thinks that if you're not physically writing, but you're thinking about the 
story in your head or you're yes. working on stuff like that, that too is writing. I subscribe yeah. to that. And I'm always seeking inspiration and stuff like that. But when I say that um, I can write anywhere, literally I can write anywhere because I'm a New Yorker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Most of my reading and writing has been on uh, buses and trains and, you know, all that type of stuff. I mean, I got a lot of good serious uh, reading and, and writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the trains in New York and the buses. Right. And stuff like that. Well, I was about to say that when you are so New York to me and I and, you know, I, I feel it in your language and just your energy is so New York, but you have really been in D.C. for quite a while. And so even Too long. <laughs> I mean, but but you have been here for such a long time. So even as you speak about this, you know, you can write anywhere because of your experience in New York or growing up in New York. What, how has DC kind of impacted your writing practice? Has there been anything that shifted or changed because you're now kind of transplanted here? I know you, you travel quite a lot for your, you know, your work, but. Well, you know, what, what, what fascinated me about coming to DC and I, I was invited to come teach at Howard university mm-hmm. by the great, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Eleanor Trailer, And so I was in the middle of a graduate program up in Binghamton, New York. And she called me up and I said, yeah, I'll do. Yeah, I'll come. You know, I couldn't look a gift for in, in the mouth, right? Right, right. <laughs> at that time, I was burnt out. I did eight years at LIU yeah. in Brooklyn and I was like, I don't want to teach anymore. But um, Howard University uh, approached me and I was like, yo. So I went out to DC. I still have my crib in Harlem. Mm-hmm. And when I got here, it just so happens that a lot of people knew who I was. There was a yeah. built-in community and they bum-rushed my classes and stuff. So community occurred so fast. So it was very inspirational. And also it was the first time when I was really hired exclusively, I mean, as a creative writer, as a poet, you know, right, doing right. poetry workshops and stuff like that. Right. So. Whereas in New York, at LIU in Brooklyn and Meg, um, Borough Manhattan Community College and those places, City College, all those places I taught, um, my, it was the separation between church and state with regard mm. to writing life and activism life mm-hmm. in my teaching. You know what I mean? That was my right. job. Over here, it became one and the same. Right, 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 right. And so it's been a, a big flourishing of you know, productivity. Right. You gain a lot of inspiration from, from your students. Right. I, and, and I'm glad you even, you, you mentioned that because that is kind of where I'm going regarding, you know, I'm, I'm actually surprised that you're surprised how the impact that you have, you have had on people who, who are familiar, that people are familiar with your work, first of all, and then the impact, because you are just this really powerful voice that when we speak of social justice or activism, um, it is on, it's not subtle in your work a lot of times. Like it's there. We know what you're passionate about. We know what that, you know, you're in, that your your pen is part of the movement. And so I just want you to speak about that. Um, you know, what is the role of your activism in your writing? Have they ever not been so um, connected, so soulfully co- connected? And was this a journey for you to be able to um, to speak through your writing in the way that you do? Well, you know, John Coltrane has an album and a song called Giant Steps. Mm-hmm. I mean, at a young age, I was taking giant steps because I was always reading. I was always studying the masters. So let's say when I first fell in love with literature and wanted to be a writer, and fiction was my first love, but um, poetry came so naturally to me. I was in high school. I I was in the ninth grade and in high school when I started writing my first poems. Um, And so the poems came out naturally, but they were like the the, the poetry of a beginning poet where you're writing sad love poems, you know, Mm. personal stuff like that. But as I got older, I started reading um, uh, James Baldwin, you know, and James Baldwin literally taught me how to write reading all his um, essays and stuff like that, and mm-hmm, time, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, I read through you know, all of his essays and I related to him directly because my family was from the, the, the Park Avenue Harlem. He was talking about 
<laughs> and all that stuff. And I was like, wow, I saw myself in that, just like I saw myself uh, in the in the Langston Hughes landscape of Harlem. Mm -hmm. uh, and that picture of Langston on the cover of the book, mm -hmm. of his collected poems where he's looking back and I'm like, wow, he looks like somebody in my family. So wow. I can make that connection. But so um, I was studying, I was reading, I was studying and I was making these leaps and bounds. And so when I was in the military, you know, I was lugging around a copy of um, uh, the Communist Manifesto. Wow. <laughs> in, in the trouble. military. <laughs> and in trouble just for having it on my desk. Um, <laughs> and then when I got out, I was just, uh, my first teacher um, at um, Baruch College, City University of New York, downtown mm -hmm. in Manhattan, was Addison Gale, it just happened to be Addison Gale Jr., the proponent of the <laughs> movement. So he was my first, you know, English teacher. Right, <laughs> so, right, right, right. But he was like, I was destined, you know what I mean? So um, I was just immersed and I just got, I was already, you know, ahead of the pack in terms of, in my generation, in terms of my political analysis. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have to go through like a nationalistic phase that right. the generations before me went through you know right right so, right uh so I it just became one and the same I was reading a lot of black art stuff I was reading a lot of um Latin American writers Caribbean writers African mm -hmm. writers and poets and stuff like that and mm -hmm. these resistance artists was my you know my main inspiration right but I had a grounding with other type of literature prior to that so I I, I always subscribe to Mao Zedong's whole edict where you know, you have to have the art and the politics and they have to equally weigh. You have to have the aesthetics and the content equally weigh. You mm -hmm. can't just be about speechifying. You got to be about creating art, you know, right. art comes first. Right, and it right. Naturally, and I just write from a natural perspective, from growing up in the projects and the hood and all that stuff and uh, being in a family that's tough <laughs> in New York. Right. <laughs> I, I don't get a sense from you and I want you to um, contradict me if, if I'm wrong, but I don't get a sense that it was much obstacle to you really developing into your full writer's voice. And if it was an obstacle, um, how did that show up? Uh, it, it, was there any obstacle to being able to show up with your full voice? There wasn't any obstacle actually. I mean, I, I when I was an undergrad at Baruch, I had this one professor. She's a you know relatively well re regarded poet. I won't I won't name her. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, um, she noticed like the first day of class, I think, or second. You know, we had this class at, in the evening, and she noticed my talent right off the bat. So when she was giving back the work at uh, after after class, she you know she singled me out to come you know and and, and praise my work. But she basically was like, stay away from the politics. <laughs> wow. So in my mind, because I was older, you know, I went to the military right. first, make money right. for college. Went to, right. So I was like, I wasn't like an 18 year old kid. I was like, right. you know, I'm on my own. I was like my early 20s. Right. I didn't, and I knew who I was as an artist. Right. I did not allow that to, you know, undermine my efforts. Right. And I don't think she meant it in a bad way. It's just that she right. came from a different reality, aesthetically. Right in terms of the art. Um, right. So I just said, okay. But I, I knew, you know, I knew who I was right. rolling with at that time. Right, I was rolling right. With Baraka and, and Miguel <laughs> Agarini and right, know, right, all right. these stuff, yeah. Right, I, and I love the fact that you even characterize it that way because it, it's, it, it's a response to your art, but you didn't allow that to, to really impact how you yourself viewed well, it was like, okay, this is feedback, but it's not going to really. Because ever since I started, I was getting these double-edged compliments, right? On one hand, it seemed like a diss, but I was savvy enough to take the compliment and say, and run with it like a football, right? So right, when I right. was in high school, I was in high school, I was, I was accused of plagiarism at least three times. Wow. One by... Um, a Spanish teacher who, she was a white Cuban woman who was kind of racist, I felt, um, mm -hmm. who didn't believe that I wrote this original story. Wow. And I actually wow. wrote this crazy story, which 
I don't have because one of my aunts threw it away because she was she was a, a clean nut freak and stuff and she threw my stuff away when I was in the army. Oh wow! But she, um, my grandmother helped me translate it into Spanish, and I turned it in and she said, "You couldn't have possibly believe blah blah blah. This you got this from a magazine or something like that, right?" Wow. So she failed wow. me for the joint and I was really upset and pissed. Wow. So I went and got my Rachel. Um, to defend me or whatever <laughs> came right. and this in my head. But um, I took it as a, a tremendous compliment. Another teacher, um, I was very quiet in class and I would be doodling in, in the um, thing and she would have us keep a journal. And she said something out loud that was like a diss towards me or whatever because I was kind of shy and, and not raising my hand all the time. Mm -hmm. And I wrote, I wrote in the margins about that shit, right? Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was literally writing like James Baldwin or trying to mimic James Baldwin's sentence structures because you know he had these long ass um <laughs> sentences that go the pages but right. they particular punctuate punctuate right. that's how that's how I, uh, I learned punctuation right and so I was writing kind of sophisticated because I was reading a lot and I was writing and she couldn't believe it and she said I didn't know because she was being racist and I pointed it out in the margins of my right. journal right but when she she got it and she read the journals and she actually was one of the teachers who read every kid's journal. She was like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. And then I had another teacher. Uh, I could, I almost uh, didn't graduate from high school. There was wow. one class. It was a marketing major. Mr. Bard was, uh, <laughs> was my teacher. And um, he said, because I used to be absent, I used to be sometimes a lot late for that class because it was the first class in the morning. And I came all the way from Co-op City in the Bronx. And mm. in that time, you had to go all the way to the whole damn, you know, <laughs> uh, project <laughs> area. I mean, the whole co-op area just to get to the train station. So it was nuts. It took me like two hours to get to school. Um, so I was late a lot and mm. um, sometimes mm -hmm. absent for that first period. So mm -hmm. I was hanging by thread. And he said, OK, Tony, I'm going to give you one last chance. You, mm. could, you have to write a long essay if you want to pass this class. I said, okay. I went home, busted out, brought it in. And he said, oh no, you couldn't have possibly written that. By that time I was already writing poetry and people, all my friends and people who knew me were like, they were, they were like, no, Mr. Bard, Tony is a real writer. He's a real writer. He wrote that. He's a poet. And, blah, blah, blah. and so he passed me with a 65 and I, and I was able to graduate on time. Wow. Wow. So you, I, importantly that, 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 um, uh, August Wilson was accused of plagiarism and you know, mm -hmm. other writers. Right. It's interesting. My, my daughter is a, is a writer and um, she had a similar situation where it was, um, you know, the, the same type of because it's so good, you couldn't possibly have written this. And yeah. she, re she responded with and this was in one of her college classes. Um, and she responded with so much grace. But what I'm really in floored by as you recount these stories and when I first asked the question it's like yeah I don't really have I didn't have any obstacles but then you share all of these stories where you've had these engagements with people who underestimated you and you <laughs> you made that choice but by them saying that I couldn't possibly have done that and I plagiarized and accused me yes of I took the validation and ran yes with it. yes <laughs> yes you know like mess me up <laughs> yes that's a, such a lesson like that that is such if, if, if you really want to be real it's like a spiritual les lesson on how to receive energy and transform that shit you know and how it's it, it's really them honoring your work by being surprised <laughs> at how good it is you know what I mean I, think I was fortunate enough because I felt like well I, thinking about it now I think that I I had I was born to be like that. I was made that way because yes. when I was, you know, my mother was addicted to heroin and um, she gave birth to me and I, I had heroin coursing through my body, right? Wow. Okay. And wow. so she was scared to say anything about that because when I came out, I was like having withdrawal symptoms and all this stuff. They had to put me in an incubator and mm -hmm. the doctor, you know, like stymied as to how, what was wrong with me. They didn't know what the deal was. And they were begging and pleading with her. And, and I didn't find this out until I took care of my mom when she was on her last year and stuff. Wow. And she revealed this stuff to me because it was always a mystery to me what happened. And blah, blah. Mm -hmm. 
So when she finally confessed, uh, you know, they said, thank you, you just saved your son's life. Blah, blah. I write about this, but um, you know, um, I didn't, I wasn't raised by her. They took, they took me from her. I became a ward of the state instantly and a white, um, a white family from Queens, New York raised me for my first year until my paternal grandmother fought for custody of me. And then, you know, mm -hmm. she had me and raised me mm -hmm. and told my mom that she was going to raise me because she wasn't in the right place to do that. And so I never grew up angry or bitter towards my mother mm -hmm. because I felt like children are so, babies are so special and precious. They had to be a reason, you know, for some reason at a young age, I had that type of wisdom or whatever. And mm -hmm. I think I, that applies to a lot of things that I don't let get to me too much. Mm -hmm. That's so, wow, that's so evolved, <laughs> you, you know, this level of self, self actualization, you know, be, and, and, and I'm, I'm wondering because you have been in so many spaces, you know, mentoring and, and helping build other writers, you know, and, and, and it sounds like you have this, um, awareness of your own psychology does this go into how you help shape how you shape your instruction or the inner engagements that you have with your students you know a, apart from the the writer's craft and that type it sounds like you you understand that psychology that you're built with that really have has helped that's a great that's a great question that has a lot of insight into it you're good at this well, i'm gonna tell you. oprah to, you, to get you all <laughs> show Khadija and Gail is going to get jealous but you know, don't worry about that she's got her stuff going all, all right, um, well, well. <laughs> um, what you just said really like got me excited um is that you know you would think that because I have I'm, I'm from New York you know I'm known I have a reputation of being political and loud and blah 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 all this type of stuff you would think that I would be the type of artist or so-called teacher of poetry or mm -hmm. creative writing that would be a big personality that would expect my students to be acolytes of me or write like me. Mm -hmm. But no, I try to bring out their voice. I try mm -hmm. to get them to hone their uh, voice and their craft according to who they are. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to write like me. You don't have to write political stuff. You don't have to write social stuff. You, you know, I want you to write like you. I want you to be the best artist that you can be mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. perspective of what you know. Mm -hmm. I just want you to grow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want you to have a choice of weapons, as um, Gordon Parks would put it. You know, I want you to know, <laughs> how to do know how to do that, know how to do anthologies, know how to do a chat book, know how to rock different forms and things mm -hmm. of that nature and mm -hmm. write in different genres. But I don't want you to be, you know, a mini me. Right, no. right. Has, has, has teaching um, influenced your writing in any way that you could probably gather, you know, looking back as to how you came to, to teaching as this writer? And you've been teaching creative writing now for a while. I know just as an observer um, of you from social media aspect, I know that um, folks get a hold of you, take your classes, and then they don't leave your side. Like they're on your social media. They love you, like, and are very outspoken about how much they just love you and they're still connected to you even after having your class. Is there something that you've been influenced by, um, you know, because yeah. at, from a teacher that or has changed your craft in any way, do you think? Well, you know, it's interesting. You know, I always ascribe to Paolo Ferrer's notion that, you know, the great um, Brazilian uh, revolutionary educator that, mm -hmm. you know, we all come to the table, to the classroom, with, with our glass, you know, mm -hmm. and it's usually half full or whatever. And your glass, you as a student, your glass is not empty. I'm not here to fill your vessel. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Right. We do this exchange. You come mm -hmm. with 18, 20 years of experience or so, and I mm -hmm. come with experience and we come to resolve these issues and stuff. He says mm -hmm. this in the um, pedagogy of pedagogy the oppressed. Of depressed. Mm -hmm. But so I have, I kind of like ascribe to that whole you know, Socratic dialectic uh, approach to, mm. to, to teaching. So um, I learn a lot from my students, mm -hmm. you know, it's an exchange, so I grow as well. 
and all educators, if they're worth their weight in, 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 in anything that has to do with positivity and teaching and growth, they too learn from their students. It's like when you teach literature, right? Mm -hmm. you, you're learning more that you know about a text each mm -hmm. day each time you are engaging with the students. Mm -hmm. When you teach creative writing, you know, you're, you're engaging and you're lecturing at times and you're, you're, you're prompting. And then mm -hmm. you kind of learn what you didn't even right. know about these things until right. you were put in a situation where they had to come out of you to right. share it, right? Right. So in that regard, we're constantly learning and growing. And even, you know, just practical. I, I've written a lot of stuff with my students, giving them a prompt, and I do the prompt as well. So you mm. you have that advantage, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That that is so that you know I relate to that so much because even in that type of dynamic, when you're analyzing a text, they may ask you a question <laughs> or it's something you may never have. Like what? That is a good question. I have no idea. And then you deconstruct that with them. So it sounds like you've had um, quite a few moments like that where you know their perspectives have really influenced the way that you approach something people have to understand is like it's hard being a creative artist mm -hmm. a writer poet and teaching at the same time mm -hmm. because teaching and writing they're both creative uh things yes they so are they become very drained and very spent mm -hmm. and so you have to kind of like sometimes you could go without writing yourself because you're mm -hmm. in teacher mode but if you say, well, I'm going to write with my students, then that allows you to keep producing as you are teaching. Wow. Very, very draining. And, and yeah, disturbing. you just I think you just shared one of your secret powers with the world. I think um, folks watching this probably and, and I can tell you that that's a whole paradigm shift looking at uh, your students as co-facilitators and you also being a learner. And it's so interesting that you um, bring up Paolo Freire because I know um, the late Bell Hooks was very heavily influenced by his work, um, so much so that many of her, sub her texts um, revolved around deconstructing some of the, the things that he brings up in his texts. And I, I, I bring her up because she was a writer, but who also wrote texts for future teachers to, to really um, gain insight when they teach. Is that something on the horizon for you? You know, you are this multi-genre um, writer, you know, you've done everything, almost everything possible, right? It, do you see in, in your future um, writing nonfiction, you know, things that speak to your your journey as a as a writing teacher um for those who are you maybe like, right you mean like writing well shout out I, to the spirit of the great uh bell hooks and you right. know bell hooks did poetry she wrote children's yes, books she, you know, yes she did like she wasn't just a theorist and academic and all that exactly stuff. She, she was really into all of the genres but um right. You're just emphasizing what I, I too believe about Bell Hooks, but I know that like her her text teaching to transgress um, was really oh. where she where she's you know and I've cited that book so much so that's one of my favorites. But so are you I, saying you're asking me if I would write a book about you know doing creative writing and stuff like that or just nonfiction in general because I've written and published just nonfiction no, about teaching though because I, oh, I've, I, teaching? I I don't I don't I don't even know if you're realizing how many gems that you're sharing in terms of just the practice of teaching and and being an artist but also teaching artists you know and you're showing you know, just your practice in general to be able to um, refresh and to maintain and, and, and build and maintain capacity for yourself as an artist while also being a functional and affection, effective teacher. Is that something that you could even see yourself doing a text around that, around that craft of teaching, yeah, teaching artists? Yeah, I've been asked to do um, essays, you know, around craft books that are coming out, anthologies and stuff like that. And also wrote, I got a, um, um, a memoir piece coming out of Obsidian along with some fiction, a novelette and a couple of poems, about three poems or so. Um, shortly, it should be coming out. I mean, 
it's probably being delayed or whatever. But when do you sleep? I feel like you have a book coming out every every three to six months. Like when I don't understand. <laughs> when do you not? You know, when do you rest? That's take a, a break. That's a good question. I, I, <laughs> let me tell you something. I feel like I'm undisciplined and I waste so much time. You know, it's just ridiculous. But, wow. Um, I was more disciplined as a writer. Wow. You know? Yeah. Well, in pants at a certain time every day. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Because, you know, I'm a New Yorker. New Yorkers are notoriously impatient. Yes. And my grandmother used to always say, have patience. Have yes. Patience. Yes. That D Diane Reeves song comes to mind. Be patient. But, you know, as we close out, I do want you to um, plug anything that you have coming up the pipeline. If you want to revisit or reintroduce to us the, the book that you um even though it's only in London, so I don't know, it's a tease or what, it, you know, for those of us who are U.S. based. Uh, che Che Cole. <laughs> Try to find it somewhere. Uh, <laughs> this we joint can... came out, I and I, Bob Marley, my children's book, the audio book came out uh, 2021 as well as the Che Che Cole joint. Wonderful. Live Oak Media. Ah, so it's only an audio book? It's, it's not a... Um... Uh, it's a, can, no, I have a, it's an actual children's book. Let me show y'all. Okay. This joint came out in 2009. <laughs> yes, look at that. Because I bought Molly. People always say I and I because it's, they see that on the cover, but it's a wraparound cover. I love it. That's beautiful. The, the audio book finally just came out, which I'm really excited about. But um, Jamie, no, Link, uh, who is this? Uh, <laughs> Jamie Lincoln Smith, the actor. Uh, he, oh, he's uh, reading it. Nice. Yeah, I, I just do the introduction. And this came out last year. Death with Occasional Smiling. Poetry. Poems. Yes. And who's that? Is that, um, who's the publisher of that? Where it's can folks here. get that? Uh, Indolent Books out of Brooklyn. Really nice, fine publishing job they did. Yeah. Oh, okay. So now, can just close out a piece for you. What'd you say? I'm going to close out with a piece for you. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. It's the opener for um, Death with Occasional Smiley. And um, actually, the artist Sammy Miranda even made a broadside of this poem. And I've done this poem a lot, but I like it because it's, you know, it's funky fresh. And it's actually a poem that I wrote coming off of the funeral of the great Tato La Viera, who was a um, New Yorkian uh, forefather who passed away a couple of years ago. And dame un traguito means give me a little shot. It is clear to see that Jesus was a conguero, beating back bongo skins till his palms bled raw shot red. No need to put an accent over the E to know who he be. Claro que si. Pa, 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 pa. Cu, 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 cu. Pa, 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 pa. Cu, 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 cu. Pa, 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 pa. Cu, 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 cu. Cu, 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 cu. Then he sang back up boogaloo for a batala. Swore by the hypnotic effects of a bolero caught in the throat of a rising sun suddenly sinking. A Tecatos Jones coming down on 110th Street and Lexington Avenue in the crusty eyelash of El Barrio. Then he multiplied wine by sending his little cousin people to cop a few bottles from Pepo's Bodega, where he kept a Muscatel stash just beneath the alabaster statue of San Lazaro and Bustelo can earn of Doña Chicha's ashes atop the register with the faded Polaroids of his pregnant tia in Ponce and his songless tío with the afro the size of Saturn in Sing Sing. Inked up from head to toe, it's plain to see that Jesus spoke in 4-4 four, four time in Wanwanko. That he tapped his dusty, rusty, patent leather zapatos to a rhythm only the children of Africans and Indians understand. Bailando con Yemaya, buscando la clarida, singing El Agua Limpia Toro. Oh, was he born in a manger or Morisania Hospital? The critics will ask their silly questions 
like social workers, dumb to the reality of the times, but Jesus will pay them no mind, nor will he adhere to the census takers, given the side eye to tax collectors. The only numbers he cares about come out in New York, in Brooklyn, so he could buy his baby a new pair of shoes, so he could walk on water, dry puddles of old wine, no piss, or tap his toes, trying to mimic the sound of dominoes, click, or ring fingers slapping against the stiff neck of beer bottles to one sun big viejitos in Guayabera shirts and Panama hats shouting, Manteca! Con cerveza breath, working his arms and legs into a sweat drip, rum stench, rumba, furious frenzy as if despojando, saying to no one and everyone in particular, what he begins to hear, reverberating, break dancing, bomba planting, plana in his inner ear. Fijate! <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. You know, the the craft in in in, in your writing with mixed with your presentation you are just fire man thank you so much tony Medea. For, thank you for, I, I, oh my goodness thank you so much video <laughs> of the hurston wright foundation i'm honored yeah. to be here hurston yeah. wright is doing the damn thing yes and you helping us do that damn thing and so with you know closing out this is the last thing i'm asking you to do that website, yes, that's what I got. That's what I got. Tell us where to find you on, on the socials. Tell us your website and everything where folks can buy your uh, books. I am on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I have a website. I think it's called Tony Medina <laughs> Org. You can find me on Amazon page too. I got all my books listed on amazon.com. Where you want people to go? Where where you gonna get the money if they go? Where you want folks to buy those books? Wherever, wherever you can get books, it, it doesn't gotcha. matter. Gotcha. That's but what. Indie presses need a lot of help. You know, indie um publishers need a lot of help. I mean, a uh, bookstore vendors. Okay. And stuff like that. So okay. that'll be nice to, to support the um the bookstores that are not the big giant chains. You know? Okay. There you go with your activism. You can't you stop can. it. It's in the blood. I, and you know, before I even start us on another conversation, I'm gonna um, bring this to an end, but I just wanna thank you so much. Um, I know when I have read your work, um, I I have hope and it, it gives me hope because you do not separate yourself from your arts. And so um, with that said, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. But thank I do you. have to say one thing because you asked me a question that I forgot to answer it. You said, oh, okay. what are you working on next? What are you coming up? Well, you actually sent a poem to one of my upcoming projects and it's a double anthology that I'm co-editing with Mudiwa Pettis, who is a PhD that teaches at Nigga Evers College. And we've been working on this, these two anthologies. One is called yeah. Everywhere Drums. Shout out to uh, the great Jane Cortez with the title. And um, <laughs> uh, Walk Right Up to the Sun is the second one. Oh, uh, I didn't I didn't ask because I didn't know. You know, I know sometimes when folks are in the, the midst of um, putting stuff together, they may not be ready to start promoting it. But I'm well, we glad haven't even uh, we, we haven't even curated or edited the joint. So we're still in that right. process. Right. You're, you you have submitted to to one of those. Yeah, but see, you're not supposed you're not, you're not supposed to tell folks that I submitted when you didn't tell me if it was accepted yet. Because then I don't, I don't know if I'm. It don't matter, fly, man. It don't matter. You know. <laughs> we want to put some good good vibration. Right. Some good juju there. out there. But you know what? This is yeah. an example of what I said earlier that every three to six months, I swear to God, it seems like a Tony Medina piece is coming out, and I know that you are always always contributing to the the literary canon canon for the culture and i just love it and i just i send you many blessings you notice my anthologies that i've done bum rush the page and defensible me a roll call resisting arrest it's we gather the people together we like to be, yep. able to be the first ones to publish such and such and we give opportunities for um, yes you do 
to. And 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 yeah. all your work, your work has always been communal. So if you're not talking about things that are um, you know, part of the contemporary lexicon, things that the discussion that we're talking about, you're creating this with you bringing together people who are part of that discussion. And that's why I appreciate you so much. I think these anthology projects are really part of that. Like everywhere yeah. you're kind of call together the tribe. You know, yeah. Well, you know, I hope. You know, I, I hope I get a shout out in the book that I know is going to come, um, that you were motivated by our conversation to get that book out for teachers, you know, as somebody who, oh, who, yeah. who is a teacher. I know that I know that folks will lap that up. So when that comes out, T Tony, I'm expecting you to mention that we talked about this and for you to just be saying, like, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about that at the time. <laughs> you know, like you're just going about your business and then somebody puts an idea. And like, oh, no, I have too many ideas. Uh, right, 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 right. I wanted to jump into that brain of yours. All right. Well, you have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much for being part of the Black Writers Studio. We appreciate you and thank you for all you do for the culture, ma'am. Thank you for having me. I'm an honor.